Good evening, everyone. Uh, hello to everyone here in the room on per in person, and hello to people listening in online. Um, it's such a huge pleasure to be introducing Professor Chris Chu this evening to you. Um, Chris, of course, is an infectious disease doctor uh, and an immunologist. Uh, and we're going to hear all about his research and his journey to where he's got. But basically what he does is understand the immune determinants of protection and susceptibility to virus infections, uh, particularly those that cause recurrent acute viral infections of a respiratory tract, uh, and we'll hear all about those. Uh, Chris started out his academic career uh, in clinical medicine, studying at Cambridge and Oxford, uh, and followed by general medical training in East London. He was awarded a clinical training fellowship from the Wellcome Trust, which allowed him to undertake his PhD under the supervision of Margaret Callan and Charles Bangham here at Imperial College. Uh, there he was studying the very earliest events in the CD8 positive T cell responses to acute viral infections. Uh, he then completed his um, speciality in infectious disease training, uh, obtained an MRC clinical scientist fellowship which allowed him to go overseas to the United States and work with Rafi Ahmed at the Emory Vaccine Center in Atlanta, where, of course, Chris was studying the immune responses to vaccines such as influenza and varicella zoster. And then when he returned and established his own multidisciplinary group here in the UK, he collaborated with colleagues at Imperial and internationally to develop what he does today, which is really a unique take on experimental medicine. Chris is really best known, I think, for his human infection studies, uh, where he and his lab uh, study the immune response to, in, in a controlled way to uh, viral infections uh, in people who have been infected or vaccinated. Uh, this is patient-centered research investigating both the systemic but also the mucosal immune response, and we're going to hear, I'm sure, all about this. These are highly specialized methods which Chris has really uniquely developed himself and carved such a niche for himself that he is internationally recognized for this. For example, of course, Chris was the chief investigator in the world's only, and certainly the first, SARS-CoV-2 human challenge study. And leading on from that pioneering work, he's now leading international consortia to take those human challenge models further and better understand human immune responses, both to infections and vaccines. His contributions both nationally and internationally uh, earn him positions on committees such as the JCVI Vaccine Committee for, for Respiratory Syncytial Virus Vaccines, the WHO R&D Blueprint uh, Committee for Influenza Virus. Uh, but I think what's really remarkable to me uh, with Chris is his leadership skills that, that I've really seen come out in, for example, the SARS-CoV-2 challenge and beyond in the consortia which he's now driving forwards. And what is amazing is that Chris is able to conduct and control, if you like, uh, internationally renowned scientists themselves from all around the world who dial into these meetings or come in person. And I think that the respect that they show Chris is, is really a mark of their huge um, admiration of his scientific capability and his ability to not only be a fantastic scientist, but a great person to work with. Uh, and I'm sure that will come through in your talk today, Chris, but really from a personal perspective, uh, so pleased for you to be here delivering this to friends, family and colleagues, all of whom admire you immensely. Over to you. So thank you so much, Wendy. That was such a kind introduction and I'm blushing. Um, I, first of all, I just want to thank you all for, for being here, for, for taking the time to come and listen. Um, the, the support and, um, and help that I've had from all the friends, colleagues, and family in this room have really been instrumental to everything that I've done. And I'm going to tell you about my journey and a little bit uh, in more depth about the, the research that we're doing at the moment. And to start, I'd just like to talk a little bit about where I've come from and, um, and about my family, because this is uh, a key part of who I am today and why we're all here. 
Uh, my parents and I are first generation immigrants. My parents largely grew up in the post-war period and then during the early communist regime and, and left China during the Cultural Revolution. And both of them were academics, um, but in particular, you can see my mother there, who's in the audience today, um, is a clinician, and, um, and really I've been following in her footsteps very much and, and hopefully building on everything that she's taught me. So I was born in Hong Kong, and this is me on the left with some cousins and obviously already looking quite sort of worried about the world and, <laughs> and trying to you know, problem solve uh, even then. And, um, and it was really the, the belief in education, learning, and uh, tr hopefully trying to make a, co a contribution to, to society in general that led me to my studies in Cambridge and Oxford and then later on my medical training. And it was during my undergraduate studies in Cambridge that I first came to appreciate how amazing viruses are. So, you know, often we don't think about this, but but viruses are really tiny and simple, and yet they make such a huge impact on all our lives. And you can see in this, uh, in this diagram on the left, you know, an influenza virus is so tiny compared to a cell. It's just a little strand of ribonucleic acid, which gives the code for its, um, for, to program the proteins that it can make. Um, it's encapsulated by some proteins, but really it doesn't have even enough to, to replicate itself. And it needs to go into a cell and hijack the machinery of your cells to be able to replicate. And so this is what is shown on the right here. So these strands of, of RNA are released. Um, some of them go on as templates to, to form more uh, RNA strands for, uh, for the new viruses to come along. And then some of them go into this, uh, this uh, protein translation pathway, which uses the host cell to manufacture the proteins it needs to form new viruses. And so my first experience of laboratory research was in Ian Briley's lab in, in Cambridge. And Ian was and is interested in how RNA viruses regulate themselves. And the first virus I ever worked on was infectious bronchitis virus, which is a kind of coronavirus, funnily enough, um, that infect birds. And so the, the interesting thing about these viruses is that they have evolved to pack in a lot more into their just single strand of RNA than you could achieve from just simply reading from beginning to end. And so on the left, you've got a ribosome in the gray, which is the machinery which, which manufactures the protein. It, it strings together amino acids into, into long chains, which then fold into proteins. And each amino acid is represented by a three-letter code. You can see that in the, in the, uh, along the green line. And, um, and so the ribosome reads along each three-letter code and brings on a new amino acid. But with some of these viruses, these coronaviruses, uh, retroviruses, they have these structures called pseudonauts. And when the ribosome arrives, it pauses for a second, and then it jumps back by one letter. You can see that happening in the bottom, bottom frame. And so then the three-letter sequences are completely different as it continues to read along. And this is a way that the virus packs in more information, that um, it allows the virus to regulate the, both the, the amount of different proteins and potentially the size. And in the middle is one of the gels, one of the first gels I did during my, my uh, project as, a, as a, an eager 20-year-old. Um, and on the right is the structure of the, of the pseudonaut that we inferred from, from just that, that um, type of, of gel. And I thought that was amazing. You know, the, the fact that you know, this simple thing had this ability, it had evolved this ability to um, do much more complex uh, sort of life cycle events, um, which you know, certainly our cells don't, don't really do. So um, unsurprisingly, if a virus has to hijack your uh, cellular machinery, it's not good for cells. And so uh, over the hundreds of millions of years, uh, living or other living organisms, pretty much all of which are susceptible to infection by viral infection, um, have evolved different ways of protecting themselves from, from viruses. 
And the, we commonly split these into innate immunity and adaptive immunity. Innate immunity, as you can see from this tree on the left, um, really evolved with very simple organisms, you know, jellyfish and, and so on. And adaptive immunity, which is more advanced from an evolutionary point of view, um, really evolved with the jawless and the jawed fish. And obviously, we all have both innate and adaptive immunity. And innate immunity is characterized by its very rapid speed, so it doesn't particularly know what specific virus or bacteria or other pathogen that you've been infected with, but it recognizes abnormal patterns which represent danger to the immune system and can very quickly respond, gobble up um, these particles of, of pathogens or produce other sort of proteins which can um, promote a, an antiviral state. But um, what I became much more interested in and focused on was adaptive immunity because, uh, as we'll talk about in a moment, this is the basis of vaccination. And adaptive immunity is made up of, broadly speaking, two arms, B cells which make antibodies, which act to mop up, um, they, they bind to viruses, they mop them up and they stop them from, from infecting, and cellular immunity, so T cells, which uh, recognize in, uh, cells which have been infected by viruses and have uh, chopped up components of vir viruses on their surface. And the, the hallmark of these adaptive immune responses is that they can form immune memory. So once the immune system has seen a virus before, if you encounter it again or a similar one, then the memory cells which were formed before uh, can give you a much quicker, and more robust immune response, which can potentially completely protect you from, from a second infection. And unsurprisingly, there is a, an evolutionary arms race which has happened as these viruses have co-evolved with us. So on the right, you can see just a representation that basically every arm of the immune system, uh, viruses and other pathogens have, have managed to find ways to either subvert or avoid. So I went back to clinical medicine for a few years, and then when I came back and I was ready to, to do research again, I realized not only did I know nothing, having known nothing at the start, everything had changed in immunology since I had, had learned it before. So people who were sort of doing this at the time will remember t suppressor T cells, um, which then completely disappeared because people didn't believe they existed, and now are back again as regulatory T cells with a different name and slightly different. So there was a lot to, to learn again. And so I uh, endeavored to um, learn more by doing a PhD. And uh, I started this PhD at the Wetherill Institute of Molecular Medicine on the left in Oxford. Um, and I like this picture because it's at night and it reminds me of the many late nights I spent there um, where it, with awkward time points and so on. Um, and in retrospect, this was quite a tricky PhD and I, I didn't want to do a, a whole talk where I sort of gave the impression that everything went smoothly and it was all fantastic. Um, it, I had to move, uh, the lab moved from uh, Oxford to the Hammersmith campus here at Imperial and then latterly I also needed to, to move to St. Mary's. Um, but nevertheless, under the, the guidance and supervision of, of Margaret Callan and Charles Bangham, um, I was able to learn a lot. And in particular, I was focusing in my PhD on CD8 T cells. And CD8 T cells are a, a particular flavor of T cells which recognize, as I said, infect, virally infected cells are, and are able to destroy them. And in that way, are able to clear the virus. Um, so on the left, what you're seeing is a, a schematic of how T cells become activated. They then start to proliferate, so there are more of them. And then they develop the, uh, the, um, the ability to produce molecules which can punch holes into infected cells and kill them. And in this project, I was using what was then still a, a relatively new method um, called transcriptomics using microarrays. And, uh, and, and use this to, to really to try and understand what was happening at the earliest points during, um, during uh, an infection, uh, before the, the animal is in this case, started developing any obvious signs of infection. And you'll see that this is a, a theme which has gone through for my whole career actually, not necessarily by intention, but um, that's the way it's happened. 
So uh, what we found was that there are many transcription factors and other genes which were uh, very rapidly turned on uh, around, uh, you know, within 20, 12 hours of the, the virus exposure, um, including these granzymes and perforins which are able to kill uh, virus-infected cells. Um, but in, at this early stage, um, as uh, other researchers have, have followed on, probably are more to do with regulating the, the expansion of these, these CD8 T cells as they're being developed. So, um, as I said, vaccination was already becoming a, a really sort of interesting concept to me. And you know, I, I love being a clinician. I love seeing patients and making a difference to people. I love spending time with them and, and talking to them and really helping people understand what we're going to do in terms of treatment and how to get them better. But, but really, for, for wider impact, I think you know, research is, is where I thought my life was going. And so um, this is the concept of vaccination. I'm sure you're all familiar with it. But, but on the left is, again, a representation of the immune response. And so uh, when pathogens come in and infect cells, you get this innate immune response. And then a bit later, you get this development of this adaptive immune response, um, which then leads to these memory T and B cells. And in the meantime, in order to generate that, all these cells produce molecules which help to promote an antiviral state, but are also responsible for symptoms. So, you, so these molecules which are produced by both innate and adaptive immune cells are the things which make you feel sick. They make you your, sore, your throat sore, they make you um, stuffed up, and um, potentially some of this immune response can even make the infection a disease related to the infection worse and, uh, and promote these, these worse outcomes, which we've seen clearly in COVID. So vaccines work by taking only um, either killed or fragments of these pathogens, um, injecting them into people by and large. And by and large, all, the, all the, uh, the most successful vaccines that we have are really targeted at generating more antibodies. And having lots of antibodies means that when you next come and are exposed to this virus, uh, there's a good chance that they will mop them up and stop them from, from causing a, a, an infection or a disease. So vaccination has, I'm sure you're all aware, been one of the most successful healthcare interventions. And um, on the left is just a sort of time course of all the different vaccines that we now have, and many of them are routinely given in childhood and, and also in adulthood. And on the right, you can see that a number of previously devastating infections have really largely been controlled. Um, of course, smallpox has been completely eradicated. And the WHO estimates that around 2 million deaths are averted each year by vaccination, and that doesn't include the potentially 5 million deaths per year from smallpox if that hadn't been eradicated. So that's all great, but what about respiratory viruses? Why are we still living with respiratory viruses every year that are causing disease and death? And not only that, but it make us all feel rough and stop us from going to work. So on the left here, I've just pulled some of the, the, our local data. So this is from last, uh, most recently from last week. And this shows you the, the, the array of different viruses. I know you can't read the, the legend. Um, but the, the three most important are, in terms of severity, are influenza virus, respiratory syncytial virus, or RSV, and obviously recently SARS-CoV-2. Now, we have vaccines against all three of these viruses. So how is it that we still aren't able to, to control these infections? Not only uh, do these uh, infections cause severe disease in individuals, uh, we, the, 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 their, their sort of epidemiology also has a major impact on society as a whole. So on the left here is, is a, a, a sort of estimate of of the, the deaths caused by RSV, and you can see these sharp peaks um, which contribute to winter pressures, um, pressures that mean that the NHS during the winter is really stretched, but then perhaps less so at other times of the year, and really make resource management very, very difficult. 
On the right is a chart of deaths around the world. And that's just to remind me to, to say that most deaths from these respiratory viruses happen around the world generally. Um, and uh, the second thing is that, that to remind me to say that these disproportionately affect older people. So the top chart is deaths in people less than 65, the bottom in uh, people aged over 75, and you can see that the numbers are vastly inflated for the people over 75. And that is a big problem for an aging population in the UK and the developed world, but increasingly in other parts of, of the world as well. Of course, we all know about COVID, and so uh, both SARS-CoV-2 and other coronaviruses and influenza viruses have pandemic potential. And uh, so COVID on the left. And the thing to highlight on the right is that while COVID was uh, really a, a disease of, of older people and people with problems with their immune system, when pandemic flu comes around, often it disproportionately affects young people. So it's not just an older people's problem. So why can't we better prevent respiratory viral infections? And I've just simplified this into, into some of the key themes which I just wanted to highlight. So the first is that viruses change and mutate. Um, they may have animal reservoirs. So for example, flu viruses may be in uh, domestic birds, wild birds, um, uh, pigs, and so on. Um, and they may come into human populations. But even if they don't have animal reservoirs, they tend to mutate as they pass from, you know, between people. That means that the intramuscular vaccines that we have today um, are, have a really hard time in protecting against multiple strains because they really are focused on developing antibodies against single strains of, or, sorry, or single variants of the virus. The other problem with intramuscular vaccines is that they're very good at preventing severe disease, but they're much less good at preventing mild upper respiratory tract infection, which nevertheless are major contributors to ongoing transmission and spread of the virus. So it's very difficult to control the movement of these viruses through the population. And together, this means that people don't like these vaccines. You have to have flu vaccine boosters every year with a different formulation. Um, you have to have the new variant boosters. And this means that people just don't take up these vaccines very well, unsurprisingly. So going back a bit, I, you know, quite early in my career, I started thinking about you know, what do we need to know to better induce protective immunity. And I, I tend to simplify it into this, into this schematic. So after somebody is exposed to a virus, they can either completely resist infection, so no evidence infection at all on the left, or the virus can start to replicate. And in the people where the virus replicates, uh, most of them have mild disease, some are completely asymptomatic, and, but some develop life-threatening disease and later death. And if we understood the factors that contribute to the left-hand path, we could potentially make better vaccines to, to really sort of address these, these issues. So um, when I came to, to start thinking about my ongoing research, I was actually really surprised to find that there was very little that people knew about how humans respond in terms of those antibodies and T cells to infection and to vaccination. We know a lot in animal models um, and we know a lot in patients, but um, these models haven't given us the full picture. So with animal models, you know, most of these animal mo animals are not natural hosts for these viruses. Um, they usually don't fully replicate the disease and sometimes animals are fundamentally different from humans and you get very misleading results from them. Um, at the other end of that spectrum, you have patients who are obviously the most relevant people to be looking at uh, immunity in, but in these cases, you don't know what virus strain or dose they've received, you have no control over the environment, there's very great differences between these individuals and um, usually you only find out about these people once they've started developing symptoms, which may be several days since they first 
were exposed to the virus. And so um, there's, a, there's also a, a sort of limitation on what you can understand from, from these, these people. So uh, I thought it was time to learn about experimental medicine. And experimental medicine is defined as investigations undertaken in humans to gain understanding of disease or test new treatments. But I think, in particular, it's focused on interventions, interventional approaches. So you do something to either your patient or a volunteer, and then you see what happens afterwards, and then you learn from that. And, um, you know, I've been working with viruses in, in dishes, gels, and mice. So it, I needed to go somewhere and learn more about experimental medicine. And I decided to go to Emory University in Atlanta. Nice weather, as you can see. Um, and uh, had a secondment at the La Jolla Institute as well. So again, nice weather. And um, people ask why or what the benefit of going abroad is. And obviously, there's the benefit of learning about work from new people in, in new places. But also, I had no friends there. And so, although latterly I did make friends, such as here, Daenerys Targaryen uh, in the bottom right, um, most of my time was spent working. And, and that's a good thing. Um, so I was working in Rafi Ahmed's lab, and that's, that's him on the top right. And, and uh, if you know him, you'll know that he is one of the world's leading T-cell immunologists. Um, and the other, I think, amazing thing about him is if you look at all of the people who have trained in his lab, they, a large number of them have gone on to become world-leading immunologists themselves, which really is a testament to, to something he's doing right. Um, in his lab, I also worked with Jens Ramat, who was his, um, a senior postdoc in his lab, and Anish Mehta, who was a clinician who helped um, obtain the samples. And really, from these people, I learned how to combine basic science, really fundamental, rigorous science with human studies. And so the, the study I'm just flagging up is a, a study of flu vaccination. So this was in 2010, so people were still being vaccinated with the, the pandemic 2009 uh, flu vaccine. And what we found was uh, they, they generated a, a, a good B cell response to this vaccine, and we pulled out the, the uh, antibodies that these B cells made, and quite a large proportion of them were directed against um, very well conserved, meaning um, similar across all strains of, of these types of, of flu virus, uh, which means that they could potentially be used to make universal flu vaccines in the future. And on the right, you can see the hemagglutinin, which is a, a protein on the surface of the, of the virus, um, you can see the top has this sort of mushroom head which, which changes very quickly and is the normal target for most of the flu vaccines. Um, but in this pandemic situation, the, the, the single 2009 um, containing vaccine was able to induce these, these, uh, these monoclonal antibodies, which is that sort of blob on the, on the left, which are directed against the stalk of the hemagglutinin, which is essential machinery for this protein to work, and therefore does not change very much between strains. So this is a, this, this theme of, of um, targeting conserved parts of proteins is, is really the key to developing vaccines which are going to be able to protect us against multiple strains of coronavirus or, or flu. Although we can learn a huge amount from, from vaccines, um, at the end of the day, I thought that we could learn even more from infection. And latterly, I think we've been proved right in the, in the course of COVID um, with some really compelling data which shows that um, vaccination on its own is very good at protecting against severe disease. So I'm sorry my pointer isn't working, but. Um, whether you've had previous infection or not, with two doses of vaccine, you are very well protected against severe disease, which is what's shown on the left. But if you look at the ability of vaccination to protect against mild disease, which is what's shown on the right, you can see that two doses of vaccine, um, which is the second column long, has basically no protective eff efficacy in the long term which suggests to me that there is something special about being infected that makes your immunity better. And if we understood this, then we could potentially make our vaccines better. 
So to, to do this, and you know, as Wendy was saying, to, to identify a, a niche which other people weren't exploring, um, I started talking to Peter Openshaw, who's here today, about the possibility of doing human challenge. And he suggested this idea to me. And at the time, I thought, this is wild, but cool. Um, this is, this is and, and, it, and it really harnesses what I can do. You know, I'm an infectious disease clinician. Um, I'm interested in people who get infections. Um, but I also want to be able to control the uh, study and really analyze what is happening without all those confounding factors which are a problem with natural infection studies. And we talked about human infection challenge. And this is defined as deliberate inoculation of volunteers with defined pathogens in a controlled setting. And these types of studies are not new. So um, with flu, these were first conducted in the 1930s. And then for, uh, for several decades during the middle of the 20th century at the Common Cold Research Unit, which you can see up on the right, um, these types of uh, experiments were being done. To, and they were really instrumental in helping what we now take for granted as the, the different effects of a virus strain, maybe the dose, the, the route of delivery and exposure um, on how severe a, uh, an infection can be. Um, latterly, people were also doing transmission studies. So on the bottom right, you can see um, some people, some have been infected, others are not infected. They're playing cards to see whether one can pass on the virus to another. And, uh, and, and more recently, as immunological techniques became more uh, advanced and established, we started thinking about protection with, with these studies. So, um, of course, uh, a human challenge study to, to uh, prove protection is, again, not new and was first formally conducted by Edward Jenner up on the left with, with a cowpox, which protected against subsequent smallpox in James Phipps. Um, but over the, the course of the 20th century, these types of studies have been increasing in, uh, in use and usefulness. You can see the number of clinical trials on the left increasing steadily over the decades. And now there are human challenge studies uh, developed for, for many different pathogens, not only respiratory viruses, but also bacteria that affect the gut and parasites. And these are now a, an almost standard part of the malaria vaccine development pipeline. And over 40, 45,000 people uh, have been estimated to have been inoculated with one pathogen or another in one of these studies in the past seven decades. So together with um, a PhD student and a clinician of Peter's called Max Habibi, uh, who's up on the, the top right, um, we set up the RSV challenge model. And then uh, over the, a, a few years later, we set up the flu challenge model. And this is a, a schematic showing what you do. So basically, uh, the, the first step is to screen participants, make sure that they have no risks of, of developing more severe disease, um, nothing that might, uh, might concern you about their participation in the study. Um, you then take, uh, you are able to take a large number of different types of samples, not only blood, but also samples from the nose. And um, uh, in collaboration with clinical partners, um, the, we've been able to sample also the lung and the lower airway, and I'll show you some of that in a moment. Uh, we then uh, inoculate people with RSV or flu, um, and then we have to quarantine them for, for 10 days to make sure that they don't spread the virus outside in the community. Um, this also gives us the opportunity to keep a very close eye on them, so we're absolutely sure that nothing untoward is happening to them, that they're, they're not getting more severe symptoms than we expect. Um, and we can take samples from them quite frequently during this time, which is not something that you can do in any kind of sort of natural infection study. So uh, this is just some example data from flu and RSV, and what you can see is that the clinical outcomes, what happens after somebody is given the virus, is very much like that schematic I showed you earlier. So on the left is a, a pandemic 2009 flu challenge study. Um, so when you inoculate people, the majority become infected, but some of them remain uninfected. And then the majority of those who do become infected develop symptoms of an upper respiratory tract infection, um, cough, sore throat, blocked nose, that sort of thing. Um, and a minority develop fever. RSV is generally a less 
uh, symptomatic illness. And so although a similar proportion of people were infected or uninfected, the, uh, more of them had no symptoms. And because we can sample in very great detail and frequency and granularity, we're able to look at the course of infection um, in, in a way that you really can't with other sorts of studies. So in the top, you've got flu. Um, and you can see that within 24 hours, people start developing symptoms. Mostly, these are upper respiratory tract symptoms in blue. And at the same time, you get virus appearing in their nose, um, which peaks around day four, day five and then starts disappearing, uh, controlled by your, um, your adaptive immunity. Um, with RSV, it's interesting because there's a, a three-day lag period where you get nothing, um, no symptoms, and really minimal virus, after which the same sort of thing happens. I don't have time to talk to you about why that's happening, but uh, I'm happy to talk to you about it later if you, if you like. So it's on the basis of our experience, so that was 10 years' work developing these sorts of models, and I'm going to show you more data about the actual immunology in a moment. But it was on that basis that in 2020, the Vaccine Task Force came to me and said, would you like to think about making or developing a SARS-CoV-2 human challenge model? And the immediate reaction is, what are you talking about? Um, this was, you know, April, May 2020. There's still lots of things unknown about SARS-CoV-2 then. But um, despite that, we started to think about it. We brought together a lot of different stakeholders to start th discussing it and latterly to develop the, the model. And the main rationale for this was to, to, uh, uh, to try and um, find a way of uh, quickly testing vaccines in case the first generation of vaccines didn't work or didn't work well. And in fact, we didn't need to do that. In, uh, fortunately, we didn't need to do that in the end. But we still needed to understand a lot about immunity, um, which is up there in the top left. And latterly, it's become obvious that we need still to develop better uh, vaccines against SARS-CoV-2, particularly in terms of cross-strain protection or transmission. Um, obviously, you know, these types of studies throw up lots of ethical questions, and this is a, a whole talk in itself, but the SARS-CoV-2 situation really um, uh, put a, a sort of um, a fire under ethicists and, and the community to really think through the ethics of this type of study when there were some unknowns about safety and long-term effects and so on. And so the WHO has really taken a lead on this and, uh, and established some ethical guidelines and criteria. And of course, there are many things that we have implemented to ensure safety in, in the model. So these are the clinical outcomes of the, of the first SARS-CoV-2 study. Um, just to say that there was a lot of public support and interest for this study, which, which gave us support for carrying on with it. This was a study of people who had no previous experience of SARS-CoV-2 infection, and this was before the vaccine was being rolled out to young people. And so um, these people had no previous immunity against SARS-CoV-2 specifically, um, and using the tiniest amount of virus, we saw an infection rate of 53%. And much as you see with, with flu, in fact, the, very quickly after you, you are exposed to the virus, you um, are able to detect virus first in the throat and then in the nose, which peaked to extremely high levels and then got better on its own, controlled by the immune system. Uh, most of these individuals did develop some symptoms, but they were all generally quite mild, and mainly sort of upper respiratory tract symptoms. There was some tiredness and, and feverishness and so on. Um, just to reassure you, there was no long COVID in this, uh, in this uh, group of people. So um, the, the real pleasure in, in establishing models which are unique or where you're able to do things which other people can't do is that you get to work with really amazing people um, on things which you wouldn't have necessarily done yourself. And so I just wanted to flag some of these and show you. So on the left is, is uh, an example of a collaboration with Chris Woods, up shown on the left, um, where we've used wearable sensors to be able to detect the onset of flu infection before um, the virus is detectable and before people notice symptoms. Um, this isn't one of our study participants. 
Um, and on the right is a way of potentially diagnosing the onset of, of, uh, of a viral infection using genes which are turned on and off rather than directly looking for the, um, the virus. And, and the sort of unique thing about this particular study is that we were able to look over time, and there are some of these genes which are upregulated early and may mark the beginning part of infection, and another gene which is upregulated late and marks the later part of infection. And if you take both together and look at the relative amounts of expression of both genes, you could potentially develop a marker for what stage of the infection somebody is at. Um, the other thing which I think is going to be increasingly important is understanding transmission. And this was work in collaboration with Wendy, um, Jay Zhou, who's in the audience, and Annika Singanayagam were really instrumental in, in helping uh, run these studies, and Mike Bearer from Leicester, who developed um, this, this particular specialized mask, which allowed us to collect uh, exhaled breath and measure the virus in that. Um, and then Wendy's team went into the room and, and sampled the air and swabbed the surfaces. And this is potentially a much better way of estimating whether somebody is going to be contagious or not than just sticking something in somebody's nose. So the, my lab's core questions remain these, though. So what distinguishes people who remain uninfected despite virus exposure? Um, what factors can reduce the severity of symptoms? And in particular, how can immunity in the airway be, be harnessed to reduce infection and contagiousness? Because this is where the virus first gets in, and this is where the virus has to leave you to be able to infect somebody else. So, of course, there are inherited factors that, which contribute to this. This is a, a collaborative study we did with Dennis Coe at Duke, uh, which identified this one gene, which um, a mutation in which made people more uh, susceptible to more severe influenza symptoms. And uh, innate immunity, of course, is critically important, and I, you know, I've skipped over a lot, but collaborating with, with Peter, Max and Ryan Thwaites, um, we discovered for the first time that neutrophils, which are classically thought of as protective against bacteria, when they are in the nose at the time of virus exposure, actually make you more susceptible to the virus. But, you know, innate immunity and, and genes, they're not really tractable for, for vaccination. We're not really going to be able to, to, uh, uh, to harness them in, in the very near future. And so we focused very much on adaptive immunity. And unsurprisingly, we found in the RSV model that antibodies in the nose, particularly specialized to protect those, um, those surfaces, uh, are higher in people who are resistant to infection. But that antibodies in the nose don't last very well. So on the left is RSV. Um, you can see that after the infection, the antibodies go up, but then they go down very quickly within six months. And this is also true in, in that first infection with, with SARS-CoV-2. You can see in the red that um, by day 14, the antibodies in the nose have gone up very substantially, but they already start to wane by day 28. And uh, the, the later part is confounded by natural infections that people have had and vaccination and so on. Um, but you can see that the trajectory would have been down if they hadn't been boosted again. So um, we thought that potentially this was due to uh, the, all of those um, arms race factors that the viruses might be making to, to Im impair host immunity. And so we worked with uh, um, a biotech to test this vaccine which they had made against RSV, which was, uh, had only the, the surface protein, none of those, um, uh, those internal proteins which might interfere with the immune system, and this was designed to be delivered by spray to the nose. And in fact, this vaccine was quite good at inducing antibodies in the circulation, even though it was sprayed into the nose. So after two doses, you had a durable immune response uh, in terms of antibodies compared with RSV infection on the right. But actually, this vaccine wasn't very good at inducing, uh, surprisingly, antibodies in the nose. And we were surprised at this. And, and as we sort of looked at it, it became apparent that this wasn't because it wasn't working at all. It was just that some people already had quite high levels of antibodies in their nose. And in those people, there was no response at all. 
whereas people who had low levels of antibodies in the nose, um, they had a much better response. So, uh, so trying to induce antibodies in the nose involves a lot of challenges. And so what about other arms of adaptive immunity? Well, I just wanted to, to bring you back to this figure, which was uh, in the individuals who were challenged with SARS-CoV-2 but didn't become infected. And this is a unique feature of this type of study. You know, in the field, you wouldn't know whether you'd been infected or not uh, if you didn't develop symptoms. And in these people, some of them had no viral detection at all, but some of them you can see had these very low level blip viruses, which suggests that something is happening, maybe there's a tussle between the virus and the immune system that ultimately leads to control of the virus and, and no uh, symptomatic disease. And so we've been using really cutting edge techniques, collaborating with Sarah Teichman at the Sanger Institute up on the right. Um, Rick Lindebohm in, on the left is a PhD student of hers now, um, uh, sorry, postdoc of hers who has now set up his own lab and Marco Nikolic at UCL. And we looked at the array of cells which were present in the blood and in the nose using, um, using the pattern of genes that are turned on and off in, in those cells. So this is the next, next, next generation compared to the microarrays which I was working with when I was a student. Um, and you can see that each of these little dots in the different colors represents a different cell with a different pattern of genes which are turned on and off, which lets us know what kind of cell they are and also what they're doing in the, in the context of um, the, the infection over time. And perhaps unsurprisingly, when you look at the, the immune cells in the nose, uh, in people who develop a symptomatic infection, which is in the bottom uh, graph, nothing much happens in the first few days. And then as they develop symptoms and the infection, um, the, the cells come into the nose and peak around day 10. But what we were really surprised by, um, both in the people who had those viral load blips, but also in people who had no viral detection at all, is that there was a very rapid response within 24 hours. And if you look on the right what kind of cells they are, I know it's a bit complicated, um, they can involve a, a wide variety of cells, but one that leaps, one type of cell that leaps out are resident memory T cells. Resident memory T cells are a special type of T cell which once they're generated, they live in the tissue and they're designed to uh, respond very rapidly to, uh, to further infection. And um, over the, the previous 10 years, we've been looking at resident memory T cells in the context of flu and RSV, um, not only in the, uh, in the nose, but also in the lung, which you can see here. And this is work all led um, from the clinical side by On Min Khan on the right and, and um, some very talented postdocs and students in my group who uh, uh, are now moved on to, to bigger and better things. So you can see that in the lower airway, this is the lining of the, of the lower airway, the green cells are CD8 T cells, which are, are, are generated and, and drawn into the lining of the, um, the airway following infection, and that having more of these, um, these virus-specific T cells in your airway um, is, uh, is correlated with reduced severity of disease. So uh, what's the potential for stimulating more of these uh, T cells? Well, this is just my only slide of preliminary data. This is unpublished, um, but this is a study led by Nana Marie Lem, who's in the audience today, um, where we have been uh, administering the uh, Oxford SARS-CoV-2 vaccine as an inhaled aerosol. And what you can already see is that between the pre-vaccination time in day 21, whether it's in the blood, but particularly in the lung, you get this massive accumulation of SARS-CoV-2 specific T cells, and that's just shown in the, um, in the graph on the right. So going back to the title, where do we go from here? Well, I think in the, in the short to medium term, we are still uh, developing better injected vaccines. And there are, you know, as you know, RNA platforms which are really revolutionizing uh, our ability to make new vaccines. Um, but I think in the longer term, we really still need to understand better how immunity in the, in the nose and the lung works. And particularly, you'll have seen from that graph earlier on, why do some people develop better, bigger immune responses compared to other people, even though they're getting the same sort of stimulus? Um, I think 
uh, it's an ambitious aim, but we want to develop more nasal and inhaled vaccines. Um, they may complement injected vaccines, but in some cases they may be able to replace them. And in those cases, they may be a lot more acceptable to people who can't tolerate injections and may help with, with vaccine hesitancy and acceptance. So as I said, that's a, that's a really ambitious aim. Um, as I've sort of alluded to throughout, there are lots of things we don't know and lots of hurdles to overcome. But I'm, I, I have a lot of hope that we're going to be able to get there, uh, partly because of all the fantastic people that, that I've worked with. Um, on the sort of left, um, colleagues from, from the European Union who we've worked very closely with in, in collaborative consortia. That's uh, Pasteur's tomb on the bottom left, which we went to, to see. Um, collaborators in the US, and you might be able to see some of the great and the good of, of respiratory viruses from the US in the middle panel. Um, clinical colleagues um, in, in, in the bottom. Um, and, uh, and also increasingly other collaborators from low and middle income countries where we are trying to uh, set up these studies so that we can understand how viruses affect people from different backgrounds and, and uh, geographies. So that's um, Accra and Mombasa in the bottom right. And of course, uh, I couldn't have done any of this without my, uh, the, the people who've worked with me in my group um, who have evolved and, um, and increased in size, but uh, throughout have been tirelessly working to try and get these things, um, you know, get all our outputs together, all the while making sure that these studies are as safe and as uh, and tolerable for, for our study participants as possible. Of course, there are lots of people I haven't mentioned already um, that I need to thank, uh, but I'm, I'm just going to put that slide there. Uh, of course, all the study participants, none of this could have been done without them, and there are many, many clinical teams who also helped contribute to this work, and of course, all our various funders um, and, um, and donors. Thank you. That was wonderful, a real tour de force and a lovely journey to, to come with you and wonderful to include very latest and unpublished data in an inaugural lecture, thank you. Um, we have some time for some questions which Chris is happy to entertain. Is there anyone in the audience? Yes, please. Yeah, thanks very much indeed, most impressive. Um, I was one of those guinea pigs in the common cold research unit when I was a medical student when I was a medical student in the 70s, and I was, you always shared with one other person, we both got dripped with the same pipette, and my friend got a horrible cold, and it ruined his whole week. I got nothing and enjoyed the free beer in the evenings and, <laughs> and had a great time. So I do hope some useful research came out of it all, although I have heard varying reports on that. But my question really was, all well and good to uh, inoculate people with coronavirus nowadays, but what if somebody says, oh, I've developed long COVID? Difficult to disprove, isn't it? Well, first of all, thank you for volunteering for, for those studies. I, I think they, like I said, they have been instrumental for our understanding of a lot of uh, viral disease and so on. Um, and uh, yeah, maybe we should think about giving beers to our participants, um, not something we do. Um, yes, so participant safety is clearly top priority for us in these types of studies. And um, when it came to COVID, there was some difficulty with that because you know, we were early in the course of the pandemic. We didn't know necessarily um, how many people might be affected by long COVID and what might be the, the sort of long-term consequences of that. And I think in those cases, you really have to balance the, the, um, the potential harm with the potential benefit and then talk to the volunteers about those, you know, what you know and what you still don't know. And you know, all our volunteers, as you were, are autonomous. They're able to make decisions for themselves. And, and during the pandemic, there were some really um, 
important questions that we needed to understand, things about how long the, the infection lasts for, whether the diagnostic tests that we're using are good enough to be able to help people um, come out of isolation, for example. And those are things that we contributed to. And we told people you know, there is this possibility of long COVID. The risk, we think, in, in young people, this was in a study in 18 to 30-year-olds, the risk is low in these people, but we can't completely um, negate it. And if you enter this study, you might develop symptoms which go on for, for a, a period of time. We will give you all of the, the standard of care, the best quality of care that we can to try and manage those symptoms as much as possible. But I accept that it's, a, it's an area of difficulty and probably not something that you would want to do in a kind of ordinary situation. Um, I understand that there are some kind of objections um, and obstacles to challenge studies. Um, so, for example, the, the COVID one took about six months to get ethical approval for, um, and obviously there aren't very many of them going on at the moment. I was just wondering if you had any comments about why you think there are um, the, these potentially very long ethical review processes, uh, why there aren't more HCTs going on, and if you have any thoughts on, on perhaps what, what policies need to be put in place uh, to do something about that. Yeah, absolutely. So this was the first time a challenge study had been set up during a, an active pandemic. So I think there was, yeah, everybody was learning and that included the ethical review committees and we were hyper cautious. We were, we were really, we really didn't get going properly until we saw that there was very good data which showed that um, our population in particular of young people would be highly unlikely to get more severe disease. And there are lots of things which we are waiting for before we progress to the next stage. I think next time we will have learned those, those things and can certainly contract some of those timelines already. Although that information about whether or not a, an infection is likely to cause more severe disease or, or more severe long-term consequences is still what we would need to wait for before we started actually doing the, the challenge study. Um, there are lots of other things which, which slowed down the process as well. And actually, we are um, now funded uh, to, to try and, um, try and uh, develop the capacity to, to do these studies more quickly in a more relevant time scale. <coughs> Um, I think that uh, that involves in, uh, yeah, um, the, the buy-in from multiple stakeholders. So not only academics but all, and the, the study participants themselves, but also regulators, government, um, ethicists, and so on. And, and so in this sort of inter-pandemic time, we're working to try and really work out what are the key things that we need to, to speed up to be able to make this research most relevant next time uh, an outbreak happens. Great. I think we've got one question online. Can we have that now? Yes. So there's a question online asking about the applicability of your research to um, developing vaccines and immunotherapeutics in infants and neonates. Yeah, it's tricky. Um, so, you know, adults, well, Babies are not just small adults and vice versa. Um, so, you know, you can't necessarily extrapolate directly from what you find in, in an adult with a, a mature immune system and potentially multiple previous exposures, not only of the virus that you're interested in, but also lots of other infections um, and take those findings directly into, into children. Um, so I think that is a potential limitation of this type of research and we have to recognize that. Having said that, um, for in the RSV field, one of the, the major uh, strategies for trying to reduce um, neonatal or infant RS, severe RSV disease is vaccinating mothers. And, uh, and um, so at the same time as protecting the mother, you're also able to transfer antibodies from the mother to the, to the uh, neonate or the, the fetus. Um, and so there are still areas where that may be, uh, the, the findings that we have may be really important. Great. Ajit? Thanks for a wonderful lecture, Chris. Um, going forwards, 
the role of the challenge model is very clear and very important for testing new interventions, um, therapeutics, vaccines, and so on. But in terms of understanding pathogenesis, how do you see the model um, contributing more information to understanding protective immunity in a, in a population now where everyone, for want of a better word, has a very sort of muddied immune response. It's very extremely heterogeneous. We all have different uh, antigenic, you know, histories of antigenic exposure. Uh, it's rather like the influenza situation now um, with SARS-CoV-2 as well. Have you thought about a way in which the, the model could help to, to, to still make new contributions to understanding protective immunity? Yeah, I, I think it is a, a challenge. Um, and, you know, as you say, it's, it's the same challenge that we've had with, with flu and RSV, where people have been multiply but variably infected with different strains and, um, and uh, different viruses at different times. Um, I think that uh, while the model may not be perfect, for asking those questions, it is certainly substantially better than looking at natural infections. Um, at least in these models, you are controlling the stimulus, so um, everybody is getting the same thing. And I think increasingly, we're, I, I think the field in, in terms of protective immunity is thinking about whether actually there are multiple factors which are involved in protection, that it's not just a single measure of antibodies or a single measure of T cells, but actually that in order to really get an accurate estimate of uh, what is protective, we may need to put together different factors and somehow create a sort of index which, which um, represents how at risk somebody is. And I think that with the advent of machine learning and with mathematical modeling, we've started working very closely with mathematical modelers to really to think about this, um, either teasing out individual markers which may act as correlates of protection, or in fact um, combining different markers to make more accurate ones. Um, I, I think that is the way forward to, to think about this problem. Okay, I'm going to take one last question from Paul and then hand to Peter. I, thanks. Um, I think you mentioned, Chris, that you might know, but what is happening with RSV in that eclipse phase before it gets galloping in the lungs compared to flu and COVID, that just a whiff of the virus and, and off you go? Yeah, it, it's really interesting, and, and we, we sort of look at it in that science paper. Um, so what I think is going on is that there is a negotiation between the virus and local immunity. Um, and we can see when we look at the, the uh, transcriptional pattern during that time that the cells in the nose are not inactive. They are transcriptionally active um, and that they are upregulating um, genes which potentially are well, which are associated with an immune response that might be protective. Um, so what's happening is that there's this sort of tussle, that the virus isn't really able to get going very well, but ultimately in the people who are not protected, the virus manages to get, manages to get away from that immunity and then start replicating. Amazing. Okay, I'm going to hand over to Professor Openshaw to give the vote of thanks. Well, <clears throat> it's such a pleasure um, to be asked to give the vote of thanks to Chris for his amazing lecture. Um, so Chris has worked with me for 14 years, and I would just like to say how much he's enriched all our lives. He's a fantastic colleague, and I think his work, you know, you've seen has transformed the field, um, extending the scope of human challenge and applying you know, meticulous experimental investigation to gain deep insights into infectious disease, as well as carrying on as a clinician, despite my entreaties to really focus on the science. <laughs> um, Chris you know, has fantastic qualities. He's a, he has a great calm gentleness on the outside, um, <laughs> accompanied by 
a brilliant intellect, you know, Cambridge double first doesn't come easy, <laughs> um, and the steely inner determination, which those of us who know him well really appreciate, and, and a genuine sense of fairness and kindness combined with intellectual generosity. So such a pleasure to work with people like Chris. And I think we've all seen that you know, the field of experimental challenges become one of Imperial's top priorities because of Chris's work. Um, and is something for which we are known around the globe now as being you know, leaders in this field because of what Chris has done. So he's really transformed our knowledge of infections, of the science that underpins infection, and of where we need to go now in order to make even better vaccines. So thank you, Chris, and many, many congratulations. <laughs> So on, on behalf of Wendy Barclay, we invite you now to join us for some refreshments outside. Thank you.